Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week and to sharing some practical information security tips along the way. As always, I'm your host and security nerd, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting November 13th, 2013. So let's dive right into this episode with a story about a new botnet. Over the week, some researchers discovered a new botnet they're calling i2Ninja. Now, i2Ninja is very similar to many other banking botnets out there, like Zeus or SpyEye or Citadel. These are all botnets that essentially try to steal banking credentials from all of their victims to help uh, the attacker steal your money. Anyways, the only thing interesting about i2Ninja is that it uses something called i2P to communicate. Uh, it uses the Invisible Internet Protocol as its command and control channel. This is kind of a peer-to-peer -peer anonymizing protocol that's very similar to Tor. I've talked about Tor before, and it's a security protocol that allows you to do stuff on the internet through lots of other peer proxies, making it harder for people to track you. So anyways, the fact that i2Ninja uses this anonymous peer-to-peer -peer protocol for its command and control channel is obviously going to make it a little harder for the good guys to ever catch its command and control channels, the servers that are actually allowing the authors to communicate with this botnet. In any case, it's just an interesting development among botnets. Uh, if you use antivirus, you should remain relatively safe from these sorts of threats. Nonetheless, it would be interesting to see if other botnet authors start to leverage this sort of anonymization to their command and control channels. Next, over the week we learned about some interesting new developments on Stuxnet research. You probably remember Stuxnet, I've been talking about it for years, a very advanced uh, piece of malware that actually infected uh, uranium enrichment facilities and centrifuges. In any case, on a site called The Foreign Policy, a security consultant actually released some final research about Stuxnet. And I won't go into all the details, but the newest revelation is essentially that there there were two different variants of Stuxnet, and there was actually a variant early in 2007 that was even more sneaky than the final variant that actually leaked to the public a couple years later. And it's just interesting to read about how uh, technically sneaky this early variant was and how quiet it really was. But if you are interested in this research, I'll be sure to post a link to the 30-some page PDF file that talks about all the latest revelations. You can find it on the WatchGuard Security Center blog. Next, let me talk about a couple of breaches that may affect you as potential customers. First, really early in the week, we learned news that vBulletin, I've talked about vBulletin before, they make some some forum software uh, for web administrators and web developers to use. Anyways, vBulletin's own forum was actually hijacked, and bad guys uh, gained access to a particular vBulletin server and were able to steal login credentials and hashed passwords for anybody that uses that forum. So if you happen to be a vBulletin uh, user, you should probably go and change your password immediately. On top of that, a particular hacking group called Injector took credit for this particular hack, and they also were the same ones that took credit for the Mac Rumors attack that I talked about last week. And besides taking credit for the attack, they also claim to have some zero-day vulnerabilities in the vBulletin software that allowed them to hack the site. Now, the latest news is that there is no zero-day software. While the attackers were able to gain access to one of the, the particular servers they used for the forums, they weren't able to gain access to the entire vBulletin network. So the moral of the story is if you use the vBulletin forum, be sure to change your password. And there is no proof of a vBulletin zero day yet, so don't worry about it unless I share news in the future. On top of the vBulletin hack, this week also brought news of a brute force attack against GitHub. If you haven't heard of GitHub, it's a cloud-based online source code repository. So if you're a developer of an open source project, you can upload it to the GitHub and then all the different uh, uh, community uh, code 
coders can submit their changes to your source code. In any case, during this week, the GitHub uh, warned its users that attackers had launched a brute force attack against the GitHub, trying to crack any of the, the weaker passwords of GitHub users. In fact, the GitHub also actually reset shorter or weaker passwords of many of its users and warned the, those users that they can no longer use weak passwords on GitHub. So in short, if you use the GitHub and you received any sort of email about your password, be sure to go online and change it. More importantly, I don't think GitHub is going to allow you to use weaker passwords anymore. What that means is you have to use a much longer password and I recommend you use things like special characters and numbers and as much randomness as you can in the password. So it's kind of good that uh, GitHub is enforcing longer passwords. So let's end with what I think is the biggest story of the week, which is a news of an internet scale man in the middle attack. So this news actually comes from the research done by an organization called Renesis. And essentially they found a man in the middle attack that was leveraging something called the BGP protocol. So BGP stands for the Border Gateway Protocol, and it's essentially an autonomous protocol that external gateway routers use to talk to each other. In fact, it's, it's kind of the core routing protocol that routers use to share routes and, and information about where to send traffic with each other. And really, the security industry has been concerned with potential weaknesses in BGP for a long time. If you go to security shows like RSA or Black Hat or DEF CON, security Security researchers have had, had a lot of talks about potential weaknesses and vulnerabilities in BGP. Uh, because internet routers, core routers, rely on it to know where to send traffic, if an attacker can actually somehow poison the BGP routes or, or get these, these routers to accept uh, new routes, it can allow you to do a man-in-the-middle attacks very easily. Even if you live in America, you can actually tell someone when they're sending traffic from France and trying to go to Belgium to send the traffic to you first, thus being able to, to see what that traffic is is before forwarding it on. In any case, Renesis actually released details that they detected this really happening on the internet. And I won't go into all the details, I'll be sure to put a link to their post uh, in the WatchGuard Security Center blog. But essentially they talked about two different cases where they saw this happening over the last few years, where significant amounts of traffic uh, that was coming from uh, financial institutes, governments, voice over IP firms, a lot of very big targets was being sent to a very specific location. In one case it was being sent to Belarus and it just became a silent hop. So whenever traffic from these organizations were going to the internet, they would go to Belarus first before going to their ultimate destination. And unless you're paying very close attention to how your traffic is routed, you would never know that this one uh, destination was actually intercepting all your traffic. And the moral of the story is really that these theoretical BGP attacks that have, we've been concerned about have become a potential reality. There's really nothing uh, you can do as an individual to protect against this, by the way. The solution for this really belongs in ISPs. So it would be interesting to see how this attack changes uh, ISP and the routing industry and things like that. In any case, it's a fascinating story and I think it's the biggest story this week, so be sure to check out all the details in our blog. So that's all for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. This was a pretty short episode because I have a lot of other things I need to do, but there were a ton of other great interesting stories. There's developments to past stories I'd love to share with you. So I'll put links to all these other stories in the, the blog post associated with this video, which you can find on our WatchGuard Security Center blog. And as always, I recommend you go to that blog as often as you can because we post regular security stories besides this video. On top of that, a real quick show note, uh, next week is a U.S. holiday. It's Thanksgiving and, of course, the biggest shopping day of the week. Uh, so I probably will not release a video next week, so be sure to return the week after if you follow our, our episodes regularly. Finally, be sure to follow me on Twitter. I'm at SecAdapt. And you can also follow WatchGuard at WatchGuardDeck. Thank you for watching. And here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.